we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Urgency of Change. This week's podcast is a conversation with Chogyam Chongpa Rinpoche, entitled What is Meditation? Next week's episode is a conversation with David Bohm. This podcast is produced by Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please see our official advert-free YouTube channel for hundreds of subtitled video and audio recordings of full talks and selected extracts. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Chogyam Trungpa was a Buddhist meditation master and a major figure in the dissemination of Buddhism to the West. He founded more than 100 meditation centers throughout the world, including Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, where Pema Chodron, Allen Ginsberg and Ken Wilbur were among his many students. He wished to present the path of meditation in secular terms, developing a program called Shambhala Training. This conversation with Krishnamurti was recorded in San Diego, California in 1972. In it, the pair ask, What is the quality of the mind that is no longer held in the matrix of experience? What is meditation, and why should one meditate? They inquire into seeing without the me, and the possibility of a total observation without time and memory. You know, sir, in all the religions, in the organized religions, with their dogmas, beliefs and traditions and all the rest of it, personal experience has played a great part. The person has become extraordinarily important. Not the teachings, not the reality, but the person. And most people seek personal experiences. And if it is a personal experience of a person, then it has very little validity. Because that experience may be merely a projection of one's own intentions, fears and hopes and all the rest of it. So personal experience has very little validity in religious matters. And yet, man, human beings, right throughout the world, have emphasized the person. The person represents to them the tradition, the authority, the way of life, Through him they hope to attain or reach enlightenment or heaven or all the rest. Personal experience is really no value at all where truth is concerned. So to to negate personal experience is to negate the me. 
because the me is the very essence of all experience, which is the past. And when the religious people go on missions, or come over to this country from India and so on, they are really, really doing propaganda, and a propaganda has no value with regard to them, because it, then it becomes a lie. So, if one puts aside totally, completely, all experiences of men, of human beings, and their systems, their practices, their rituals, their dogmas, their concepts, that is, if one can actually do it, not theoretically, but factually, say, wipe it all out. Then what is the quality of the mind that is no longer held in the matrix of experience. Because truth isn't something you experience. Truth isn't something towards which you, pra- you gradually progress. It isn't that through infinite days of practice, sacrifice, um, control, discipline, come to it. If you do, then it's personal experience. And when there is that personal experience, then there is the division between the me, the person, and the thing which you experience. Though you may try to identify yourself with that experience, with that thing, there is still the division. Seeing all this, how organized religions have really destroyed truth, giving human beings some absurd myth to make them behave. Seeing all this, and if one can put aside all this, What place has meditation in all this? What place a guide, a guru, a saviour, a priest? Just now I noticed in the corridor somebody from India preaching transcendental meditation, and attend his class, and you practice every day, and you will have greater energy and ultimately reach some kind of transcendental experience. And that it, it really is quite, I can't put it into, too strongly, it is it is really a great calamity when such things happen in, to people. When they come over from India or from China or, the, or Japan to teach people meditation, they are doing propaganda. And is meditation a a thing that you practice daily, which means practice means conforming to a pattern, imitating, (coughs) 
suppressing, you know, all what is impo- implied in conformity, can such conformity to any pattern, doesn't matter what it is, can that ever lead to truth? Obviously not. Then what is meditation? If, if practicing the system, however absurd, however noble, practicing a, a transcendental so-called meditation, if you, if you see the falseness of it, actually see the falseness, not just theoretically, actually see that it, it has no meaning, then what is meditation? Then what is, first of all, the traditional meditation, whether it's the Christian, Christian meditation or the Hindu, Buddhist, Tibetan or Zen, and, you know, the whole varieties of meditations and their schools. For me all that is not meditation at all. Then what is meditation? Perhaps we could discuss that, could we? Yes, I think so. Why should one make meditation to a problem? We have got enough problems, human beings, hmm, both physically and psychologically. Why add another problem about meditation? You follow what I mean? Why give an, a human being one extra problem when he's got thousand problems? So, is meditation a way of escaping from his problems and avoiding what actually is? And therefore it's no meditation at all. Or is meditation the understanding of the problem of living? Not avoiding it, of the daily living with all its problems. If that is not understood, if that is not put in order. I mean, I can go and sit in a corner and follow somebody who will teach me uh, transcendental or nonsensical meditation, and it has no meaning at all. Right, sir? So what, what is it to you to meditate? What does it mean? I hope I haven't <laughs> made it too difficult for you to answer this question, because I, I, I deny all that. To me all that kind of meditation, of practice, of constantly repeating a word, hmm? as they do in India, as they do in Tibet, as they do all over the world, the Ave Maria or some other word, repeat, 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 it does mean nothing. You make the mind more absurd and grotesque than it is. So, if I may, together, inquire into this question. Is it because it's a long-established tradition that you must meditate, and therefore we meditate? I mean, a Brahmin boy, when I was a small boy, I vaguely remember that being a Brahmin, you went through a certain ceremony. <coughs> At that time, you were told to sit quiet, close your eyes, meditate, think about you. Know, the whole thing was set going. So, 
if we could together examine and share what is meditation, what are the implications of it, why should, why sh should one meditate at all? If it is a problem, you follow what I mean? If you make meditation to another problem, then for God's sake avoid it. You follow what I mean? Because uh, human beings have thousand problems. Why well, add another one more to it? So could we together sharing go into this? seeing the traditional approach and seeing their absurdity. Because hmm? you see, sir, unless man, human being, becomes a light to himself, hmm, nothing matters. Because if you are depending on somebody, then you are in a state of perpetual anxiety. So, could we examine this traditionally? First, what is, why should one meditate? Don't you think in the... Uh <clears throat> living situation of a man, that meditation happens as a part of a life situation. So, a human being has innumerable problems, right? He must solve those first, mustn't he? That is, the, uh, he must bring order in, in the house in the house in which he lives, which is the house, which is the me. My thoughts, my feelings, my anxieties, my guilt, my sorrow, I must bring order there. Without that order, how can I proceed further? Well, the problem is that uh, if you try to solve the problem, if you look for order, then you're looking for, it doesn't seem to be uh, looking for further chaos. No, I'm not looking for order. I am inquiring that there is disorder. Hmm? That's right, yes. And I want to know why there is disorder. I'm not wanting to find order. Mm. Then I have all the gurus and all the, all the gang coming. <laughs> I'm not, I don't want order. I only want to find out why in one's life there is such chaos and disorder. Well, and I must find, a human being must find out, not ask somebody to tell him why there is disorder. Well, you can't find out intellectually. Uh, intellect is part of the whole structure. You can't deny the intellect. Well, but you can't use intellect to solve the intellectual problem. No, no. You can't solve the problem at any level except totally. Quite, yes. Mm. Now, to, that is, uh, to solve the human problem of disorder, hmm, does that need meditation? In the ordinary sense of the accepted word, meditation. I wouldn't say the ordinary, the conventional sense of meditation, but uh, the meditation in the extraordinary sense. Uh, what do you mean by that, if I may ask? Extraordinary sense of meditation is uh, um, trying to find, to see the disorder as a part of the direction. To see disorder? To see disorder as uh, order, if you like to call uh, it. No, no. Or to, to see the disorder as order? No, to see disorder. 
Well, if you see the disorder, then it becomes the order. At first, I must see. <laughs> but to see it uh, clearly. But, so that depends then how you observe this order. Not how to solve it. How to? Of course not. Because if you try to solve it, mm. you solve it according to a pattern set. Set pattern. Mm -hmm. Which is the outcome of your disorder. That's right. Which is the opposite of disorder. Mm -hmm. So, if you try to solve the disorder, it is always according to a preconceived idea of order. There is a Christian order, Hindu order, whatever order. Socialist order, communist, communist order. Whereas if you Mere, if you observed entirely what is disorder, hmm? then there is no duality in that. I don't. Yes, I see. Now, what you mean. How, is, how is one to observe this total disorder which human beings live? Hmm? The disorder that when you when you see a television, the commercials, the hectic violence, the absurdities, the the human existence is a total disorder, killing, violence, hmm? and at the same time talking about peace. So, we come to the question: How? No. In what, what is observation of disorder? Do you see it from the me as separate and the thing which is disorder? Well, that's already disorder, isn't it? So, do I look at disorder? With the eyes of my prejudices, my opinions, my conclusions, my concepts, the propaganda of thou thousand years, you follow? Which is the me? So do I look at disorder without the me? And is that possible? So that is meditation, you follow, sir? Not all the rubbish they talk about. To observe without division. To observe without the me who is the very essence of the past. The me that says, I should, should not, I must, I must not. The me that says, I must achieve, I must gain God, or whatever it is. So, can, can there be an observation without the me? You see, if that question is put to an orthodox meditator, hmm, you say, can't, because the me is there. So I must get rid of the me. So to get rid of the me is to, I must practice, which means I am emphasizing the me. So through practice I hope to deny practice, through practice I hope to eradicate the result of that practice, which is still the me, so you are caught in a vicious circle. So. The traditional approach, as I see it, as, as one has observed it, not as I see it, but as one has observed it in the world, is to emphasize the me, in a very subtle way, but it's a, it is to strengthen the me. The me that is going to sit next to God, think of the absurdity. The me that is going to experience nirvana or moksha or heaven, <laughs> enlightenment, I mean, it means nothing. So, 
we see the orthodox approach is really holding man, human being, in prison of the past, giving him importance in his personal experience. Reality isn't a personal experience. You can't personally experience the vastness of the sea. It is there for you to look. It isn't your sea. So if you put that aside, then the question arises, is it ever possible to see without the me? To observe this total disorder of the human beings, their lives, the way they live, is it possible to observe it without division? Because division implies conflict, like India and Pakistan, <laughs> like China and America, like Russia and you know, all that. Division politically is a breeds chaos. Psychologically, division breeds endless conflict, inwardly, outwardly. Now, to end this conflict is to, to observe without the me. I wouldn't even say observe. To observe what is? Well, when you observe, then you are judging, questioning. No, no that's what I the, When you observe, there it, you can observe through criticism, through evaluation. Hmm? But a total observation. Yeah. yeah. That's partial. That's but right. to observe yeah. totally, in that there is no evaluation at all. There is no observer either. Ob therefore, what is meditation then? That is meditation. That is meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so, in observing disorder, which is essential, essentially meditation, out in that observation there is order. Not the order which the intellect creates. So, so, meditation is not a personal search for personal experience, right? Meditation is not a, a, the, the search for a uh, transcendental experience which will give you great energy to become more mischievous. <laughs> hmm? Meditation is not personal achievement uh, sitting next to God. Meditation then is a state of mind in which the me is absent. And therefore, that very absence brings order. And that order must exist to go any further. You follow the order? Without that order, I mean, uh, things become silly. It's like this. People who go around dancing, ch chanting, and repeating Krishna, Krishna, all that silly stuff, that's not order. They are creating colossal disorder. <laughs> as the Christians are creating great disorder, as the Hindus, as the Buddhists, as <laughs> long as you are held within a pattern, you must create disorder in the world. When you say, well, America must be superpower, you are going to create disorder. So then the next question, sir, from that arises, which is if you, very, it is necessary to inquire, 
can the mind observe without time, without the without memory, which is the material of the mind. Memory and time is the material of the mind. Can it observe without those two elements, time and memory? Because if it observes with memory, the memory is the centre, the me, right? And time is the me also. Time is being the evolution of the brain cells as evolving, evolving, becoming all the rest. So, can the mind observe without memory and time? Which is only possible when the mind is completely still. And they recognize, the traditional people recognize this. So they say, we must practice in order to be silent. <laughs> to control your mind, you know, the tricks they play. I don't see many particular importance in the uh, making emphasis on the stillness of the mind, particularly at all, because uh, if one is able to see the non-dualistic way of looking at situations, then you have a further energy to flow out, rather than you trying to create a stillness. You can only have further energy to flow, greater energy, when the mind is quiet, obviously. But the making emphasis on stillness ah, no. is... Ah, no. No. We said, to observe disorder, hmm, the, the me with its memories, with its uh, structure of time, must, must not be. Hmm. Then, in that quality, uh, there is a quietness of the mind, which observes. That stillness is not an acquired practice thing, it comes naturally when you have order. You see, sir, after all. What one can do is to point out and help the person to go to the door. Hmm? It's for him to open the door. You can't do any more than that. And this whole idea of wanting to help people, wanting to, you know, you become a do-gooder. And a do-gooder is not a religious man at all. Shall we go on with this? I think so. There's a further thing can be quite clarified is the <coughs> when you make emphasis on the Absolute peace. I, I, I said, sir, complete order is complete quietness of the mind. Quietness of the mind isn't, isn't, uh, is the most active mind. That's what I want you to say. It's the most dynamic thing. Mm -hmm. It isn't just a mm -hmm. dead thing. Mm. Well, people could misunderstand. Ah, because they, they, they're only used to practice, which will help them to become... That is death. Mm. But a mind that has gone, inquired into all this this way, becomes extraordinarily active and therefore quiet. That's what I mean, yes. It's mm. like a great dynamo. Mm. The greater the speed, the, the most vitality, Oh, 
of course uh, the man, I don't know, is seeking more energy. Mm? He wants more energy to go to the moon, to go and live under the sea. You follow, he's striving to have more and more and more. And I think this search for more does lead to disorder. Consumer society is a disorderly society. You see, uh, this, the other day I saw in some place a paper tissue, a Kleenex, which is all beautifully decorated. <laughs> so, how our question is does the observation of disorder bring order? That's really a very important point, because for us, for most people, effort is demanded in bringing about order. Because human beings are used to effort, struggle, fight, suppress, force oneself, now, all that has led to disorder, socially, outwardly and inwardly. Right? And the difficulty with, with, with human beings is that they have never observed They have never observed a tree, a bird, without division. Since they have never observed totally a tree or a bird, they can't observe themselves totally. They can't see the total disorder in which one lives. There is always an idea, partially, there is a somewhere in me there is order, which is looking at disorder. You follow what I mean? So, they invent the higher self, which will put order, which will bring about order in disorder. God is in you, and Pray to that God, He will bring about this order. Yeah, always this effort. What we are saying is that where there is the me, there must be disorder. And if I look at the world through the me, the world outside or the world inside, there is not only division which brings conflict, that division creates chaos in the world, disorder in the world. Now, to observe all that totally, in which there is no division, this observation is Meditation. For that you don't have to practice. All that you have to do is to be aware what exactly is going on inside and outside. Just to be aware. 